Okay, today we're going to learn about global variables. Uh, not something I would recommend you use very much. It is kind of a hack in Python, and if you learn object-oriented programming next year, you won't have to do it. But here's an example of uh, object-oriented. Sorry, here's an example of global variables. If I run this program, it's going to print the x, and there there is the two, and it gets printed out. So essentially, on line three, I'm printing. There is no local variable x in inside the foo function, and so the, it grabs. It, it goes to the second option, right? First, it looks for a local one. Then it goes looks for the global one, and bingo bongo, it gets x equals two. However, however, if I do this in, inside, what's wrong with my indentation here? If I do inside the, um, if I say x equals 3, now this program is going to fail. And it'll fail because it'll say there is a local variable, but I'm trying to access it before printing it, before, before assigning it. So it'll say, when it tries to print this x, first it'll look for the local one, and there is one. But now it says, well, you're trying to actually access it before you assign it. So this is going to fail. So a solution to this would be just simply to go like this. Whoa. Uh, x equals 3 right there. And now if I run it, yay, it works. But obviously, at this point, if I print x here, you realize that it's still going to be 2 because I'm printing the, go the global one on line 9. And when I run it, sure enough, it prints 3 and then 2. However, what if I want to affect this x, the one on line 7? I don't want to create a local one here. And yet, I still want to change it. In other words, I want to be able to kind of access this, um, this, this one without creating a new one that's in a different scope in the function. And the way to do that is by using the keyword global. And you have to specify which variable is global. Now, look what happens when I run this. Now they're both three. So essentially, what's happened is it's almost like doing this. It's almost like doing x equals 3 here instead of up here. And so that's what the global x, that's what the global statement will do is it will prevent the variable from becoming a local variable even though you're using x equals inside the function. It's a way to subvert the way that Python works. Okay? And by the way, it's not good programming. So why am I teaching it? Well, it's part of the language. I think you should know it if it's part of the language. Because there might come a time when you might actually have to read other people's code and you'll go, what does this mean? I don't know what that is. Well, now you do. Okay? Um, so that's an example of using global. It prevents a variable from becoming local even though we have an equal sign after it, an assignment. OK, so let's move on. Uh, so in the next part, we're in byte of Python here, is default arguments. OK, so these are really cool. Watch what I can do. Let's say, for example, that I um, If I had something like, if I pass a couple of variables, x and y, and I, let's say I say, um, say I say a equals 2 and b equals 3, and I pass a comma b, OK? Now, if I print x comma y and I run this it's, it should be pretty clear that it's going to print 
it's going to print 2 and 3. Let's get rid of this line here. So if I run this, I'm printing a 2 and then a 3, right? No problem. How many arguments does the function accept? 2. How many arguments am I sending it? 2. Perfect. Well, watch this. What if I only sent one argument to the function, just the A? Now let's try it. Uh-oh, this program doesn't work. It crashes. It says the function foo is missing one required argument, the Y. So it, it, it won't work. However, what I can do here is I can actually place in a what's called default argument by putting in equals and then a number or an, a value. It doesn't have to be a number. It could be any object, integer, string, float, doesn't matter. Uh, but I have to put it after the equal sign. And this goes in the arguments for in the, def, in the function definition. In the arguments, kind of like um, list in the brackets, separated by commas, I have to have an equals and then an object after that. So watch what happens when I run this. It works. But interestingly, you might say, well, how is this working? Because we, ha we still are only sending one argument the a, which is 2. But w it seems like we're asking for two arguments. And here's the catch. Watch, watch how cool this is. Look, I can call this function again. But this time, I can send a and b. So do you think it's going to work now? It does. And notice the second time. The output is 2 and 3, but the first time, it's 2 and 4. In both cases, we're sending A. That's the 2. But in the first case, we're not sending B. So Y is taking on a default value of 4. So in other words, when we don't provide an argument for this second variable, it says, that's OK. I'm going to use the 4 because you haven't provided one. So the cool thing about this is, is look how we can call the function. We can call it with only one argument or two. And if we supply two, then this get, the 4 gets overridden. The 4 only kicks in if we don't supply one. So watch this. I can provide more. I can say z equals 8. And now, if I go print the Z, too, look what happens. The 8's print out. This works perfectly. So there's no restriction on how many default arguments. So this 4 and the 8, these are called default arguments. There's no restriction on how many we can have. But there is another type of a restriction, which is a little more subtle. And that is the order in which we supply the default arguments. Notice that the first argument here does not have a default argument. So in other words, let's just try calling foo like this. Watch, ready? Let me try calling foo with no arguments. Will that work? Obviously, the y will get the 4, the z will get the 8, but the question is, what will x get? Let's try it and see. Aha! It fails. Doesn't work. And notice it even tells us the x has a missing argument. So because the x does not have an equal something, doesn't have a default argument, this is going to fail. Do you understand? OK, so let's give it one. Let's say x is going to equal 2. Well, let, let's make it different. Let's make it a 1. 
because the on line six it's a two. So if I run this now, it should work, right? Let's try it. Yay, it works, perfect. So no problem, I get it. So what was this thing you were talking about? You were saying uh, the order in which you supply default arguments? Well, how about let's try this, ready? Let's, let's take away the default argument from this side. Remember before, right? So if I leave that and I run this, if I, if I, if I leave these two, and okay, this one's not gonna work, I know that now, so let me take it out, okay? So this works, no problem, right? So what works? Let's just be clear about what works. So, um, default args follow non-default args. In other words, the x does not have a default argument, but the y and the z do. But the y and the z come after the x. Let's try flipping it around. Let's give this guy a default argument and let's give nothing for Z. Okay? Let's see if it works now. Uh-oh. Look what it says. Non-default argument follows default argument. And that, boys and girls, is the subtle restriction that I was mentioning earlier. In other words, you, you can have a function that has default arguments and non-default arguments, but if you do, the default arguments have to be have to come after the non-default ones, not the other way around as I have here. This is not going to work. And if you think about logically why that is, I think it should be very clear, because if you come down here, like to line eight, and we're sending a. Okay, so if I if I just forget about the variables, I just let's just send two. Let's send a literal value. Then where does the two go? Does it go to the x? And does y become four? Then what does z become? There's nothing left for z. Now, if I did provide a default argument for z, then everything would be fine. And it, let's say in this particular case, if I was to send values here, let's say 5 and 6, then is x 5, y is 6, but what's z? Even if I did this, even if I did like uh, you know, a 9 here, this is still not going to work because same situation. Python will not allow a non-default argument to follow a default argument. So this is OK. So if we go like this, and this is still wrong, right? This We can't do this. This is OK. This is OK. This is OK. And this is OK. But this is not OK. Is that clear for everyone? So the cool thing about these default arguments is that we can call, so now both of these will work. So I can have one, three, or none. And in each case, they work properly. If I send nothing, the values are 179. Perfect. If I send three, they all get overwritten and we get 569. And if I only send one, only the last two get overwritten and become 7 and 9. So in a, in a nutshell, that is how default arguments work. And they offer flexibility because now you can call the function in different ways. And if you say, all right, well, you know, what if they leave off an argument? Let's, let's, this should be the default argument. We'll use this in case, the, in case we, uh, nothing is provided. 
That's how they work. Okay? All right, let's move on. So the next thing that we're going to learn today is uh, keyword arguments. Yeah, I have to actually tell you something right now. I am going to teach this, but I'm going to teach it begrudgingly because I don't actually use this feature of Python and I don't particularly like it. Uh, so what's a keyword argument? Well, watch this. So keyword argument, now listen, in this case, we're going to require three things, right? Uh, there. We're sending, let's get rid of this. Uh, we don't even actually need this A and B anymore. So there, I'm sending 234. Let's run it. Okay, two, three, four, great. Um, but here's what I could do. I could say, uh, not, um, yeah, I could say this here. I could say y equals 9. Let's try running this. And now there's a different type of an error. See, I, I have actually, it's very confusing to me as to why they have this in the language. Personally, I think it should be taken out of the language. I don't understand why they have key, keyword arguments because let's just pretend, let's put, let's put default arguments here. There's a difference in the, look at my vocabulary, right? This is default arguments. And then these are keyword arguments. So what this means is that in the call itself, you specify what you want it to be. So for example, I could say y is 9, uh, x is, or no, let's, let's say z now. Let's say z equals uh, not 3, but uh, 0. And let's say x equals 4. Ready? Look how, look how weird and personally stupid I think this is. It works. Why you'd ever want to do this is beyond me. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're saying y equals 9. Notice the order in which we're printing them here. We're printing them in uh, x, y, z. So x comes first. So the 4 comes first. Then, then y. Then the 9. Then z. So then the 0. Now listen, if you wanted to pass 490, why, instead of doing this, why wouldn't you just type this? Because if I run this, they're identical. Don't you think this line 8 is much more understandable than line 7, why would you ever need to jumble up the order in which you're sending arguments? Well, that's what you can do with a keyword argument. I don't know. Maybe there is a specific type of a use case for this, but you know what? If there is, uh, how about you leave it in the comments uh, on YouTube and because I have yet to find one for keyword arguments. So it is part of the language, and we did learn it. But do I use them? No. OK. Let's move on. The next topic, actually, is uh, one I think that is uh, important and very useful. and. Um, they're called var args. And very, basically, it means you can have a variable number of arguments. So this is actually really cool. So watch this. Now, in, in, all, in all the examples up to this point, we've had to kind of, with, we've kind of had to decide how many arguments a, f a function's going to accept. And 
that's fine. But sometimes you might decide that you don't know how many things are going to be sent to a, uh, a function. You might need a variable number, like an, a changing number of things you might want to send it. Personally, you can also do this simply by sending a list. So if I, if I kind of like, I can show you like a way to do the same thing in a different way. Let's, let's fix this a little bit. Let's just get rid of all the, oops. Okay, let's just go like this. And let's send, let's send L to it, all right? And we'll print L. And then here, we'll say L equals, and we'll make it a list. And we'll, we'll put a few things in here. And all right, great. And we'll send L. OK. So if I, if I run this program now, and by the way, I don't have to just print L. I can run this, and it'll work. Three, four, five, seven. But I could also, you know, um, for x in range len l, and then I can print uh, lx, right? Run that. Oops, I uh, messed up somewhere. Oops, I didn't tab. Sorry. Let's run that. Yeah, there you go. Three, four, five, seven. Great. Okay. Uh, I can also just just for review, real quick. I can go for i item in l. Print i do, does the same thing, right? Different different ways of uh, iterating. But great. Okay, so I can send a different number of things. Want to see me send a different number of things? Watch. There. I put something else in there. I can add more things in there if I want. I can put a Boolean. I can uh, put a floating point number. If I run it, it works perfectly. So you can see you can basically send things to a function by like basing it, putting as many things into a list as you need, and then you can grab whatever you want from the from that list as you wish. However, that's not really what this part of the textbook is discussing. It's talking about variable arguments. So let's see how to do that. What I showed you is a way to subvert that. In other words, to do it in a different way. But what if I was to actually put all these guys like this, control x, and put them here? So we'll get rid of l, so no more l. Okay? So now watch this. Now I'm going to go star a. Okay? And now I'm going to go for, and I'll change this to an A, and I'll change this to an A. Notice, OK, so you might say, OK, how many things is this thing going to accept? Well, the star means that it can accept as many as you want. If I run this, oops, uh, what does it say here? Oh, I must have a still an L in here somewhere. Oh, there it is. Yeah, my bad. OK, let's run it again. And it works perfectly. OK, it works just like it did before. What's the difference? Well, I'm not creating a list here in the main program. I'm sending all these arguments just by separating them with commas. And essentially, a way to think about it is, is that they all get packed into A. In fact, here, let's test something. What's the type of A? Let's run this. I'm curious to see, actually, if this is going to be, oh, we're not printing it. What's the type of A? And it's a tuple, which is basically a uh, immutable list. 
In other words, a list that you can't change. Okay? We we're yet to learn that, but I'll just tell you that uh, a list uses square brackets and a tuple is just like a list, but it uses um, round brackets. Then the difference is a list is mutable. You can change things inside of it, but a tuple you cannot. That's the difference, and it, it's all about the brackets, the type of brackets that you use. So, okay, I give you a little definition of what a tuple is. But essentially, we're doing the same thing as we did before. We're just not creating a list first, and we can, we can take things out of here, and it's still going to work uh, just like it did before. So essentially, you can treat A like a tuple. Or if you want to think of it as a list, that's fine too. But you can't change anything in there. OK? So that is called variable arguments. And the, the key character to understand how to make that work is the star right here that comes before the variable. Because if you think about it, I mean, we've got at this point, we've got you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 five arguments we're sending and they all get put in they all get stuffed into a because of the star so that's var args now i'm not going to do star star because that would require us to learn about dictionaries first and we haven't learned about dictionaries yet uh, we'll do we'll do star star later in the course and um, we, I think we've already discussed return. So um, I'm just going to, oh, right, and doc strings. Yeah, yeah, we have to do doc strings now. Uh, but return, I just want to be clear here that whenever your program, whenever your function, I should say, encounters a return, it's over. So if I run this, nothing happens because the function exits on line three, okay? If I, if I put it after this loop here, then the function will exit after the first time it prints stuff out. It won't do it twice. So the second loop doesn't happen. Also, notice that if I put a print here, it's going to print none because I'm actually returning nothing here, watch. So notice at the end it printed none there because I'm not returning anything. I could return something. I, I could return, for example, um, anything I wish and that's fine. I could even re return something. Um, I wonder if this would work here because once the loop finishes, I think this probably work. Yeah, the last one, the last value of x. OK? So, uh, but be careful, right? Because look what happens if I tab this. Can you guys think about what's going to happen at this point? How many things will get printed out? Make a prediction. And here we go. Just one. Because now, when you, the first time you go into the loop, you print something, and then the next line says, finish the function, and you're out. Okay? By the way, if you, if you have nothing after return, it's like not having the return kind of at all. I mean, that's having a return without anything coming after it, in other words, returning none, is fine, and the function will end. But if you leave it off, and you have no return at all, this function is still going to return none. Watch. Notice at the end, it prints none. That's because we didn't return anything. And, it's, and the print statement is expecting something from the function call. But it, it, it only got nothing. And nothing is the object none. OK. Let's. Uh, 
let's give you guys a little assignment. Okay, before uh, an assignment, actually, I think it's important we learn doc strings first. So a doc, what is a doc string? Looking in the textbook here, Byte of Python, um, it is the first line of a function. If you use triple quotes, that comment, the first line, if the first line of a function is a triple qu quoted comment, that comment actually ends up being having a special purpose, and it's called the doc string. So uh, let me show you what I mean. And here. So let's go up here. And this program works right now. Great. And I will now make a doc string just like that. It's the first line of the function. And I'll say this is the doc string. Its purpose is not to say that. The purpose of it is to say something like this function does blah, blah, blah. OK? It's, it's usually to say, what does the function do? What does it accept? What should it accept? And what should it, what should it return? It's, it's kind of like a description of the function. So why is this important? Is it important for people who are programming to read it? Yes, that's one reason. But there is another one. And the other one is you can actually utilize it at execution time. How? Like this. So those are called under under, underscore underscore. And they come before and after the, the word doc. If I run this, it says this functions does blah, blah. So I can actually, so this is kind of weird because I'm actually accessing a comment at execution time. I thought comments weren't were not supposed to be part of your code. But in this case, it is. It's a special comment that you can actually access during the running of the program by using this. So how did I access it? The name of the function is foo. And then I went dot. By the way, um, some people call underscore underscore double underscore. And other people even find that too long. And they say dunder. Dunder. Double under. So I find that kind of amusing. I like that word, dunder. Um, so I don't know if it sounds something Australian. I don't know. Uh, but there you go. So that's a doc string. OK? So that right there is the doc string. And it has to be the first line. So if you, if you, if you don't put it on the first line, if I was to like, uh, or wait, if I get it out of there, and I put it on a subsequent line, and I run this, there is no doc string. The doc string is none. It only works if you put it on the first line of the function. OK? So I hope you enjoyed this class. We'll uh, see you guys next time.